All right. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. If you're in my time zone, it is 6 p.m. here in Europe. Can somebody message in the chat here to confirm that the main stage is officially over and we are allowed to kick things off? Because I can't see both at the same time. You can hear me, that's great. Anybody can confirm that the main stage is over or at least we're ready to start the first sessions. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just go for it in one minute. Not over yet, it seems. Okay, so we're gonna wait a few minutes for everybody to arrive and then get started. Medi is explaining tracks, so it's important. Uh, quick poll in the in the session chat here. Who is who's on the hop in for the first time on this uh, for this conference? Got one, another, lots. So this isn't my first uh, hop in to attend, and I presented in one once before, but my first time uh, moderating one. So there'll be kind of a learning experience for everybody today, <laughs> but we'll just keep an open mind and uh, see, see how it goes. All right, let me see if I can't just, just pop open one of these in a secret tab on the side here to check the main stage. Okay, main stage is going, so we can go. All right, so welcome to the GraphQL track. I am super, super, super excited about this uh, session today. Uh, we have really, really an incredible lineup uh, from all sorts of incredible speakers. The There's really not a lot to be said about this. If you're uh, brand new to GraphQL, this is going to be more on the uh, business angle about where GraphQL is changing actual companies or enterprises. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, if you're if you're brand new to it, the first talk should be really great for you um, because there's a lot of resources in there. Um, it's not going to be a, a GraphQL basics talk or a beginner talk. This is really how does GraphQL, uh, where does the rubber meet the road for organizations? So it's going to be a good time. I would like to then really not waste any of our first speaker's time. And I'm going to just let you know, my name is Jesse. So you can go ahead and uh, message me directly. You'll find my face in the profiles if you have a question. Happy to help you out. I'll be moderating uh, the talks today and kind of guiding us through. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. So I'm going to uh, and introduce Mark Andre as our first speaker. I'm not sure how he comes on the stage. I've been told that somebody else is here to help bring him on. Um, but let's see how that actually works for this first talk. Mark, has anybody com uh, communicated to you how you're going to join this uh, join this chat? Hey, Mark Andre, everybody. Sweet. <laughs> That's great. All right. So uh, I'm going to hand it over to you. I'm assuming somebody's going to then kick me off for a minute. And uh, it's, it's all yours. I can kick you out if you want, I think. Sure, but then bring me back in when you're done. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, let's see. So take it away. Yep. Let me just share my screen. All right, hopefully that works. If you can't see my slides, let me know. All right, so hi everyone. Uh, as Jesse said, my name is Marc Andre. I work at GitHub on the API team, and I've been basically playing around with GraphQL since about five years ago now, when it was first released. Um, so I'm from Montreal, Canada, and besides working at GitHub, I've also just released a book called Production Ready GraphQL. And where that came from is you hear a lot about GraphQL from the client side perspective but you rarely kind of heard about what it takes on the server side to power these clients. So the book is all about basically all the server side concerns of running a GraphQL API in production, a uh, GraphQL platform as well, supporting a large team of developers working on a GraphQL API. So um, this talk is 
a bit of a condensed version of the book, uh, kind of a whirlwind of a bunch of topics that are important to keep in mind when building a GraphQL server. Um, I'm super excited to have an entire track of GraphQL at API days. Uh, this is kind of unbelievable to me uh, since five years ago, four, four years ago, I was starting writing blog posts about GraphQL and the API community was very fragmented. Uh, GraphQL definitely was not very represented in API conferences at all. So this is so exciting to me um, and I'm really excited to, uh, to kick us off in the GraphQL session today. So the main question here uh, we're going to talk about through the entire talk, and we're going to talk about designing GraphQL APIs, uh, what performance in GraphQL APIs looks like, um, what security looks like, documentation. Really, we're, we're wondering what it takes to build a GraphQL API uh, because we, as I was saying earlier, the, on the server side, we haven't seen a lot of actual experience over five years. It's still a young technology. and we still haven't seen all the problems we have to deal with. So hopefully that gives you an idea. So what does it take to build a GraphQL API? Well, before we even explore how we can design a great GraphQL API, I think it's important to take a look why we use GraphQL in the first place, why so many people are interested in it, why it seems like a great solution to so many of us, and maybe also why some people are concerned about using it everywhere. So these are a bunch of reasons you'll hear why people use GraphQL and they're so excited about. The, um, they are all great reasons. They are all valid reasons in different scenarios. But to me, none of those are actually that specific to GraphQL if you take one of each at a time, right? And if you take a look at, you, you'll hear a lot about with GraphQL, you make a single request, one HTTP request to get all the data you need. And especially initially, this was written all over blog posts as the, the best thing ever about GraphQL. But really, if you think about it, well, first of all, one request is not always the best, right? We might, parallel requests are better than one large request sometimes. And also nothing, no API style forbids you from building your resources or endpoints or RPC functions in a way that would require clients to make only one request. So that's not really inherently a GraphQL thing. Then you have the under over fetching thing, right? GraphQL lets us select exactly the fields we want. And again, that's not inherently a GraphQL thing. We uh, even gRPC can let you past kind of like the fields you're interested in, in in certain implementation. You've got the sparse field sets or just query parameters to filter down on what you need. That's something we've seen across all API styles as well. Maybe it's the community. The GraphQL community is absolutely great. The tooling that comes out every day from the GraphQL community, generally the conferences, the content is absolutely great. But then again, we also have a ton of that across different API styles. The API community as a whole is great. And finally, the type schema is often talked about. That's a main point of GraphQL. But more and more, we can't really say this is unique to GraphQL by any means. Um, a lot of API styles have, have schemas, protobuf, OpenAPI, JSON schema. So all these reasons are absolutely great, and they can be useful when they need to be useful but they're not necessarily why we would use GraphQL specifically for each of these reasons. Uh, why not look at other API styles and implement these features? So what is it exactly then we're looking for? Why is everybody so interested in GraphQL? And I think there's two, two main reasons here. Uh, the first one is it has all of that as a whole package ready for you in a specification and all libraries do that very well which we can't say for all API styles, right? Um, Open API is great, but you don't have, you don't really have frameworks that have everything we've said, all these features together as a whole package. And this is not even necessarily inherent to GraphQL, but it's kind of the way it was built from the ground up and how the community adopted it is you have all of this is very, very well specified and there's no questions to be asked. And, 
that's for some people that's a plus for some people that's a minus but i think that's a big reason why we've seen such an adoption and why people love it so much is you have all of this as a whole package with you there's no pick and choose i don't want a schema but i want to select fields you've got graphql the specification so that's one part of it and i think the other part is really what makes graphql different from other api styles and it's it's strong client specific way of doing things and really escaping other not even api styles but ways we've built apis in the past that were very one size fits all um, and it's something people have struggled with for years now and there's ways to solve this as well but graphql does solve that problem of server defined resources and clients wanting to have their word in the use cases solves it beautifully. Um, so generally, if we go back to other API styles or just generally in, with HTTP APIs, the representations, the, the data the client's interested in is usually defined in the server. It, we can call them resources or endpoints or, or use cases. They're defined by a server. And the client really may have a word to say in the process of designing these endpoints but can't really do much about it at runtime or when building client application itself. And that's totally fine in some cases, right? In some cases, like a public API dealing with an enormous amount of different clients, well, maybe something more large grained like REST, for example, is the best thing, right? Maybe we want these more resource oriented, more generic, more coarse grained or large grained resources. And this, uh, this quote here is from the REST paper here. And it's, it's not a REST versus GraphQL thing. It's REST is designed for that. And it's a trade-off it makes. And GraphQL makes the other trade-off. And that trade-off here is something in recent years, we've been seeing more companies wanting to make. And I think one of the best ways to put it I've seen is from uh, Daniel Jacobson, which was at Netflix uh, when he wrote that, is companies started seeing diverging needs with a ton of different devices. And we're thinking of uh, Netflix here because Daniel was there back then, dealing with a large amount of devices from PlayStations to TVs with all different data needs and handling that with a very generic or one size fits all API starts to cause some pain when you have that context. And as he says here, making the API better, more optimized for each of the target applications is the next logical and most critical step. And this is where a lot of people start thinking of how can we achieve that client focused API style with diverging needs and how can we make the server answer these use cases without an exploding amount of complexity. And if we read the, the GraphQL announcement from Lee Byron, you see a very, very similar frustration. So frustrated with the differences between the data we wanted to use in our apps and the server queries they required. And that's com that comes straight from the announcement blog post. And it's very similar to what Daniel was saying as well in that blog post we saw. So with GraphQL, we kind of redefine that boundary between server and client in terms of their responsibility. And we see something else that's very different and kind of changes the game where the client is now much more in charge of the representation it will get by setting the requirements using the query language we love. And the server is in charge of defining the possibilities. So still a still some rules around how the data is defined, but letting a ton more flexibility on the clients to select exactly what is required there. And this lets the server define some kind of a beta model, even maybe resources, but then have tons of different diverging client needs to select what they need from those possibilities. And the, the query language is what Query language and the execution engine that the GraphQL specification uh, explains is exactly what allows us to do so.
but it's not the only way we've seen companies achieve such use cases. Um, one famous example of dealing with that problem of kind of diverging needs and independent clients is the back and forth for front end pattern where teams define client teams or experienced team define their own BFF that maybe deals more precisely or more specifically with certain clients. So here we have an example of a mobile BFF and a web BFF. And this is in a similar vein, right? Where it's a pattern that lets clients be more specific on top of maybe more a generic data source. Same thing with Netflix, very related to what Daniel Jacobson was saying, where they went for an approach where on the server, clients could register some adapters that would change the more generic server resources to something that's more client specific. So these are all approaches rather than uh, knocking on the door of the API team every time and saying, I need this new resource or I need this new endpoint for my use case letting the client have more of a say. Uh, so going across a network border here and asking for what it needs. Um, but I've been, I've been saying GraphQL is very similar to BFF a, a lot and it's, it's kind of a lie. So they're, they're similar in the sense that they, they do allow in terms of representation, a client to select or get really something more specific, but GraphQL is different in the sense that it's still the same, it's still the same API. So BFF, you, since it's a completely independent API for your client, you could change the, uh, even the serialization, uh, how the rate limiting is being done. Uh, you can change everything where GraphQL is a bit in between here, where the GraphQL does have some rules, uh, it has some types, specific types some specific fields. And you can query it in a certain way, but you can't necessarily change, uh, flatten a whole response for the client or anything. So uh, it's a it's kind of a really really great sweet spot where the API team can focus on general use cases and general resources, and clients can then pick and choose from that schema. So I think it's that's truly what makes GraphQL different from other approaches, and. It's not necessarily the fact that we can we avoid underfetching or it's more performant or run request, but that it allows us allow an API team or a server to support so many different client types using that uh, execution engine instead of letting let's say the other approaches we saw like the Netflix approach or the back end for front end approach. Um, so enough history here, and let's get a bit more practical. So the first thing we can look at now that we have in mind why we're building GraphQL APIs and where they come from, we can maybe use that to know how we want to design great GraphQL APIs. And it turns out that designing great GraphQL APIs is pretty much how to design great APIs in general. It's not so different from how you would design a REST API or a protoauth um, schema or even how you would design your Java code. And the first rule um, I've learned over the years and judging by what we've seen, how GraphQL is so great at making the client the centerpiece is to design with the client in mind and design first, and think about what the actual use cases are instead of thinking in terms of types, fields and resources right away. And that's truly important. And one way to do that is to have a first client in mind always when building a new feature. Um, so instead of um, coming up with a type product and looking at our database and adding the field store schema, thinking in terms of use cases, so add, we, our client needs to add a product to a cart, a, a product will need these attributes at first, but maybe not the whole database uh, table for a product. And the truth is, if you are on an API team or somebody who's interested in GraphQL at your company, chances are not everybody's going to be a GraphQL expert. And chances are you don't know the, you don't know the use cases for everything in your company as well. And the challenge here is to kind of find that sweet spot where 
we used the right GraphQL conventions. We def defined our GraphQL schema in a good way. But also the most important thing is we define the right things and we expose things that are useful to clients. So the, the gotcha here is those two experts are rarely the same person. So I highly encourage you to, the first step to designing a new GraphQL feature is to talk to the right people, have a first client in mind, ask them questions and bring, bring everyone to the table and discuss that design. And that's truly the reality of designing most APIs, right? That's not necessarily a GraphQL thing, uh, but it's very important to keep in mind. So when we say client and use case specific, there's a few things we can think of here. The, the first one is unfortunately quite a, a popular approach and a simple approach really. And one that's kind of attractive when you first see it is tools that will take your database schema and expose a GraphQL API for it. So you will have your entire MySQL database and you'll have a beautiful GraphQL schema with all the filters, all the order orderings, and all the fields there. And that's not something I recommend a lot, unless that's truly what you're looking for, and you're maybe building a filtering tool on top of a database, and that's your actual use case. If you're interested in really building a great GraphQL API, well-designed one, don't generate from your database schema, even though it might look similar in some cases, really turn around and again, look at what clients actually want to get from your schema. And these, these tools tend to overexpose fields and they tend to also overexpose things that you might not want to support forever. And they're, they're kind of famous for having performance problems down the line because you're exposing things that, that are not indexed and they can really be a pain if you want to have a, a GraphQL server that's going to really last uh, in time. So if you can, try to avoid coupling your GraphQL schema to a database schema. The other thing is that it's also not your UI. Um, what it really is, is as we were saying, there are just ways to achieve use cases and really stop thinking of both kind of extremes that our database schema and our UI is a great way to kind of refocus the design discussion. And one way to do one great example of avoiding that thinking of, uh, of data and databases, uh, I've been calling anemic GraphQL. And I took that idea from a pattern called anemic domain model, uh, model. And basically that comes from Martin Fowler and it's about basically having objects that have more than just data and making sure they have behavior and to avoid objects that are basically just plain old bags of data. And we can draw a big parallel with, cert with how certain GraphQL APIs are designed. And maybe this example will make that clear. Um, so here I'm taking an example from GitHub. Uh, we have a type called pull request and it has a title, description, uh, CI status to see if it's red uh, or green. And we have a list of reviews as well, where your colleagues might have left a review on your pull request. And that's maybe how our data model is structured for a pull request. And then maybe a client comes in and we want to design that uh, merge button on a pull request. And one of our use cases is seeing can we actually merge this pull request? So should the button be uh, disabled, for example? And we have all the data for this. So on a client, maybe we check that the CI status is green and that all the reviews say that the PR is approved. So knowing that, we can decide if the pull request is mergeable or not. This works, but then what if, let's say, I the server team adds a new field that's based on a third party application that will let us know if we can merge or not, or a setting that says that all PRs cannot be merged anymore, or any extra data field that we didn't consider at first. Because if we go back to this slide, our, our client didn't actually consume a use case coming from the server here. It kind of computed its own given the data we gave it. Um, because of that, if we were to add a field, every client that, would that was relying on that logic to make sure 
you can merge or not a pull request is now broken. And to fix that, it was really simple, really. Uh, we had to simply add a field that does what the client wants to know in the first place. And it sounds silly when you, you see it like that, but it's a mistake I see so often and uh, that I make so often as well, forgetting to simply um, give what the client is interested in. And there's no uh, downside to providing the, the, the raw data there as well, the CI status, the reviews as well. But providing both here is amazing because clients, a client consuming is mergeable here. We can always ensure that is mergeable is right uh, on a server side. Um, but we can't actually ask clients to, hey, we've added a field. If you have any logic that relies on this, these old fields, make sure you, you update your client side code. So this is truly important. On the right side, on the mutation side, that problem we see a lot, right? We see with, with large um, CRUD mutations like update, create, delete, that take these input fields, um, input types, that are basically a large bag of data that the client sends and basically ask the server to update or take action with. Um, so here we have an update issue mutation and you can see it's update issue, but really it can do a bunch of things. Uh, we can pass in assignee IDs to add assignees. We can maybe remove IDs to remove a label, assign reviewers, update the title, description, and looking at that, looking at the schema, even as somebody wanting to implement this API, it's hard to see exactly how everything behaves. All these fields are nullable. Which one do I have to pass? Are there any coupling between these input fields that we're not seeing here? For example, maybe I need to always pass description and title together. It's, it's quite hard to reason about. So instead, if we move to a more client specific, more behavior focused design, uh, we have now these smaller mutations, finer grain mutations that do actually what we want them to do. So add label takes a label ID and an issue ID and they're required fields. It's very easy to see how everything works. Not only that, but on the service side, it's not very simple as well because we we're dealing with a resolver that does one thing and one thing well. So this always brings the question of should we opt always for those fine grain mutations or it, should we go for the cold grain mutations? And that's kind of a hard question to, um, to answer. And it's very nuanced um, because fine grained often gives us the most beautiful API, the most pleasant API to use, but we're still dealing with a web API here. So we can't really do act as if we were um, in process making function calls. So coarse grain will always have a place and Two, two places where I see them very useful is to, uh, for things that require transactions so or workflow, so doing something atomically, often a coarse grain mutations is the best way. So we've seen people ask for transaction support in the GraphQL language. Uh, I think avoiding that is probably for the better and going for a mutation that does that thing as a transaction. And when in doubt, the cool thing with GraphQL, as we said, different clients can coexist with almost a, a pretty low cost on a server. So we can have those larger grain mutations and those smaller grains mutations coexisting and have the clients consume the use cases they're actually interested in. So that's whenever you're in doubt, whether you should add an input field, make a field more generic or fine grade versus coarse, ask yourself if you could not simply add both, if you see a, a usage for both. Um, in the same vein, it's very tempting to have these fields that slowly creep creep up to being bigger and bigger and have more generic fields as we're kind of dealing with more use cases. But again, we need to remember that same fact that we, we can afford to be specific and creating new things when needed at a very low cost. So very common example of this, a, a finder field for a user that takes either an ID or a login. Kind of suffers from the same uh, design flaws from what we've seen. The two arguments are nullable. We don't know how to, what happens if we pass none of them or both. And on the server side implementation of that field also gets more complex. So instead, we just turn that into two fields that are 
good at what they do and simple, simpler to use on a client and simpler to maintain on a server side. Try to go for overly specific names as well. Um, so instead of going for a type user, so that that's the main culprit often, that very generic type user that's used all over the place, um, go more specific. So is it a, a Facebook user? Is it the viewer? Is it an actor? Is it a bot? Um, so going very specific early on will let you discover your use cases a bit better and have the more generic names available when you figure things out a little better. So this is kind of a, a tip for schema evolution is if you're overly specific, it's then way easier to grab the generic names when you know more or you need to make a change. And don't be afraid to use more types as well. So we get stuck into the, the data models we have in our code base or the tables we have in our database, but there's no cost to adding more uh, abstraction if needed in the schema. And a very common example of this is, um, is this one. We have a type team with a members list, uh, which are users. Uh, naively, it's true that uh, team members are users. Um, so we, we have that user list, but what happens if we want info on the members of a team and seeing which one is the admin of that team? Well, now we're kind of stuck because adding an is admin on a user type makes no sense in other contexts. If I fetch a user by ID, is admin makes no sense. So what do we actually wanted here? Even if that concept doesn't exist in our code base, we were looking for a probably a team member type that has an is admin, which always makes sense uh, in a team context. And then maybe uh, we have a user field in there to fetch that the user behind that team member. But I can't tell you how many times this has saved us from uh, evolution problems when using specific fields, creating uh, new types when needed. Uh, this is great. And one good example of that best practice is the connection pattern that comes from the Relay client, which is a pagination pattern, but also has that additional edge type, which is so useful um, instead of plain list types using our more generic types. So uh, try to keep that in mind. Finally, as far as design goes, consistency and symmetry are always great and sometimes are even better than doing the best thing. So sometimes being consistent in what you've had, even if it was perfect, might be a better experience than exposing something completely new or different ways of doing things, even if you think it might be a bit better. So there's different ways to be consistent. So there's being consistent within our own GraphQL schema. Then there's being consistent with the GraphQL ecosystem platform in general, right? So the I was talking about the connection pattern. Using the connection pattern not only is a, is a great pattern, but the fact that so many GraphQL APIs implement that means uh, users are more used to that pattern. Yeah, tooling is probably better for it. So being consistent in that way is important as well sometimes. Of course, you can make uh, trade-offs depending on what you actually need. Um, and to make sure design like this, that all these practices we've seen stays true with a team of hundreds of developers is actually hard. Uh, maybe you. You're an API nerd and really a fan of great GraphQL API design. But if you're dealing with a hundreds of developers wanting to ship their features, that's not always super easy. So there's a few ways to make sure things go well. The first one is having a style guide for your GraphQL API. And it's so, so important. As soon as your team becomes a little larger, you need a style guide where you define kind of these design rules we've been talking about, why you've chosen that, and how to design your scheme on the right way. Um, documentation in the sense that how to make these changes to your GraphQL platform, linters to make sure uh, all types start with a uh, capital letter, for example, uh, breaking change detect detection because GraphQL schemas, um, we can use them not only for the client to discover uh, use cases, we can use them on the server side to build tooling and making sure uh, we're not making changes could break clients. So investing in tooling is always a good idea. And the GraphQL ecosystem, the GraphQL schema in general, makes that really effective. 
Um, so if you're looking for a linter, GraphQL schema linter is a um, NPM package that does a great job of that. And there's a GraphQL inspector that kind of analyzes changes between two GraphQL versions and will let you know if you're making breaking change, breaking changes, and maybe you can generate a cha change log from them. So that's a great idea as well. So let's take a look at implementation now. Uh, so we took a, take a look at the design part. Now, how do we want to design that? And the biggest question as far as implementing GraphQL servers right now is, should you go with an SDL first approach or a code first approach? So the SDL first approach is basically using that schema definition language that's specified in a GraphQL spec to build the schema. And many libraries um, use that to build a schema in memory and expose it. The code first approach is very similar. We're exposing the same schema, but we're gonna define it using our programming language abstractions instead. And a thing to keep in mind is that both approaches are a way to define the schema, but both approaches can be done having a design first approach as well. So nothing stops you from discussing in an issue first or a Google doc or a meeting and talking in terms of SDL and then implementing using a code first approach after. So that's a common misconception. So the SDL first approach works great um, because first of all, it's specified. So all tooling and languages work with it. It's very easy to see what we're defining. Um, developers deal with GraphQL directly. So you can see right away if you're, if you're adding a type is very easy to see because you've got the SDL right away. And possibly it makes it easier to separate your interface and implementation if you're doing it well. And it's true, it does encourage you to think in terms of design since you're dealing with that definition language in the first place. It does come with its cons though, where you have to keep the schema and resolvers in sync. Consistency, like having the connection pattern everywhere is harder to achieve because there's a lot of handwriting of patterns um, that can be balanced with tools though, but generally you can't really build um, abstractions that are kind of ready to use as well. Um, and the, the part that I dislike maybe the most about the SDL first approach is the SDL never really was intended to be a way to build schemas rather than a way to visualize schemas. And we'll see, we'll see how that affects things a little bit. Um, with code first, we kind of have the opposite where programming languages are generally much more powerful than the SDL language um, that allows us to build um, higher level abstractions. So for example, in GitHub building a, that full connection for an issue, for example, with pagination is a one liner. Uh, if we were using an SDL approach, we would need probably generators or linters to ensure they're consistent everywhere. Uh, we can abstract that using code. Um, GraphQL can be hidden from your users for some, that's a plus. For others, uh, it's a minus. For us um, at GitHub, people were very comfortable with the active record pattern, Rails in general. So having Ruby classes for types was a very natural fit. Um, the cons are very similar as well, where we're abstracting away the SDL. So maybe we're, we're writing code, but we don't actually see right away what's going to be exposed in the end, what our final schema is going to look like, because it's hidden behind these abstractions. And we're losing the SDL as a common language. So maybe we'll need language, programming language specific tools. And these ecosystems are generally smaller. And finally, maybe it guides us towards implementing too soon. But again, both approaches can be done with a design first approach and then going into implementation. So. The way I recommend um, most teams, and there's certain ecosystems like JavaScript, for example, where the SDL first approach is very mature and tools are great. So if you're using that, uh, that's absolutely great. If you're in other ecosystem where maybe it's more divided, my personal preference is going with a code first approach with the SDL artifacts. Um, and what I mean by that is we define the schema using code uh, so we can use these abstractions, we can use powerful programming language constructs, and then we always generate the SDL and check that in source control. 
So we do have that source of truth. We do see the changes using the SDL. We can run tools against the SDL uh, in our CI, maybe as GitHub Actions, um, but kind of an afterthought, not afterthought, but um, a build step from code. Um, so here we're using the SDL as a way to view the schema rather than how to define it. And that's worked very, very well for us. And I see that working very well for many people. And you don't have to fight for spec changes to allow for more complex scenarios in the SDL, uh, which is great. Um, it is, I will skip some slides, I think, because it's a long talk and we started a bit early. So I'm sorry about that. And I'll skip right away to, um, uh, to documentation here. Um, so we've talked about implementing code first is our preferred approach. And we have that generated SDL, which is absolutely great for having automated documentation um, that so many people love about GraphQL. And it's probably one of my biggest best beef is that GraphQL is self-documenting thinking, which is true. We can generate, we can generate great references using GraphQL because of that type schema, right? Um, it's very easy to get a site with all the fields, all the types defined with their description. However, documentation is not only a reference. Um, in fact, dealing with GraphQL documentation in my experience is much harder than something with REST or an endpoint based API in general, because we're dealing with a huge graph of fields and types and seeing where the entry points and the, uh, the use case are hidden in there is actually very hard. So, in fact, I think you often have to put even more attention in building great documentation for a GraphQL API because it's not easy to see um, what and how to achieve uh, the, those use cases. So examples of the, making that better are example queries, um, having great tutorials, workflows, so how to fetch uh, issues and add a label to them and really just documentation that's more human and more use case oriented. And most uh, saying GraphQL is self-documenting and exposing just a reference to thousands of types and fields is really not helpful to discover what you can do with an API. So if you're starting your GraphQL journey today, um, don't underestimate the server side complexity of things is one of my uh, first advice. Um, GraphQL gives enormous power to clients, but that power needs to be handled on the server side as well. And dealing with that GraphQL engine and um, making sure performance is great, making sure monitoring is great is very hard and we can't underestimate that. You also need to make sure we're, so as we were saying earlier with API design, GraphQL in, is not so far from other API styles. It's, it's still a web API and we have decades of best practices that are there and they're pretty much all still relevant with GraphQL as well. And finally, take your time building your GraphQL platform. And GraphQL is, is new still and a lot of, a lot of vendors, a lot of uh, tools are coming out pretty much every week and everything is so exciting. But given the complexity of running a GraphQL production, taking your time, uh, being boring with your technology choices, boring with your choices in general and more pragmatic, will probably, you'll be thankful later. Uh, so I thank you very much. If you have any questions, uh, there's, we haven't seen everything there is with uh, building a GraphQL in production. Uh, ping me, I'll be happy to uh, answer you on Twitter or in the chat here. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about these topics, uh, I have my book as well, uh, Production Ready GraphQL. So thanks a ton. All right, I'll try to add you, invite. Nope, that's not it. Looks like I can't access the mod panel. So what I'll do is I'll leave and probably somebody will add you.